this week on the Back Table Podcast. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about um, that's driving a lot of the Venus stenting for it. So I, I totally agree with Michael. And I think it's something that we have to really strive to educate people about that um, thinking that in most patients, you can just uh, only look at the left ovarian vein and only treat the left ovarian vein and ignore the rest of the pelvic circulation is just not adequate. Mark, I think that's, I think that's wonderful that you're, that, that we're on the same page on that. And we, yeah. <laughs> Michael, we didn't plan that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular and otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter, or email us to let us know what we can do to make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. Help your patients with chronic venous insufficiency see and feel a difference in their legs. Medtronic offers a comprehensive CVI portfolio that empowers you to select the best approach for each patient. Learn more at medtronic.com slash CVI Advantage. This is Michael Barraza, your host for today's episode. We're going to be focusing on pelvic congestion syndrome. I'm privileged to welcome two guests from different banks of the endovascular pond to guide us through our topic. Dr. Mark Meissner, a vascular surgeon at the University of Washington, and Dr. Michael Cumming, an interventional radiologist at Vascular and Interventional Experts in Minnesota. Gentlemen, thank you for sharing your time and expertise. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. It's a parent pleasure to be here. I should say for Dr. Cumming, it's, it's an honor to have you back. You know, for our listeners, Michael joined us about a year ago for a discussion on uh, the role of IVIS and evaluating and treating iliac vein compression. Uh, and we touched on pelvic congestion syndrome a little bit then, and we did as well in an earlier podcast with Brooke Spencer, but this is our first time really focusing specifically on this complex topic and, and reviewing it in detail. But before we dive into the weeds of PCS, uh, let's hear a little bit more about, you know, where y'all are, what you're doing. Oh, Dr. Cumming, I know where you are and what you're doing, but for the sake of our listeners, tell us uh, about your practice model and, and where, where pelvic congestion syndrome fits into it. So I, I just reopened uh, or opened a new uh, vascular center uh, with my partner, Dr. Shell Wolf, and we have just putting the finishing touches on our new 7,000 square foot facility, uh, which comes with uh, an overhead C-arm, CT, and a non-invasive lab. Uh, we're partnered with a large multi-specialty independent medical group practice of about 200 physicians. And uh, we live in our own silo and have a lot of autonomy, and which allows us to practice and, and run things the way we like. So it's a, it's a great setup. What about you, Dr. Meister? Are you primarily in the hospital setting at the University of Washington? I go back and forth in that uh, my, my practice for the has always been about 60% Venus, but for the last four or five years, it's been purely Venus as it's gotten um, too busy and I don't do any arterial work anymore. But I go back and forth between working in our, our main campus in the um, uh, interventional radiology department, and then we have a uh, clinic-based facility at our other campus that has uh, procedure rooms for doing superficial venous procedures in, as well as a OBL for doing um, uh, fluoroscopically guided procedures in. And I sort of, based on how complicated they are and, and the imaging requirements, we'll go back and forth between the OBL and the, um, the, the fixed imaging in the hospital. Understood. Um so you've developed a reputation in the endovascular community as an expert in treating, you know, pelvic congestion syndrome, nutcracker syndrome, venous malformations. And, you know, I'll, I'll preface this with the caveat that in, you know, the major endovascular specialties, uh, you know, all education, politics, and turf are, are, are local. But for the sake of discussion, at least in the areas I've worked, there, there aren't a lot of vascular surgeons treating pelvic congestion syndrome and venous malformations. So how did this become part of your practice and, and how has it evolved? You know, I, I was extremely fortunate in that, you know, I've, I did a research fellowship when I was a vascular surgery fellow with uh, Gene Strandness, who sort of steered me along a pathway, a, a career pathway in venous disease. And I did that for about 15 years. And then when vascular surgeons um, became interested in catheter-based procedures, um, we, we had a what I consider a great local solution to it, which was... Any vascular surgeons who wanted to do catheter-based procedures had to do an abbreviated IR fellowship. So I, I spent six months um, as an IR fellow at the, the age of about 46 or 47 and, and going back and, and uh, training in the 
we were initially supposed to do the full spectrum of uh, catheter-based procedures, but as as time went along, um, there there was really no need for me to do any of that. But I really had great mentorship from a few of the radiologists who trains me trained me. You know, and I'll say specifically some of the people I I worked with were Tori Andrews and and Tom Burdick and and Sandy Vija who were um, just great mentors. And I learned um, the, the the basics of how to treat pelvic congestion from them, as well as malformations. And, and the malformations have sort of continued. We have a multidisciplinary malformations practice that includes uh, myself and two of uh, my interventional radiology partners, Sandeep Baija and, and Chris Ingraham. We see all the patients together in clinic. Um, we call in plastic surgeons and orthopedic surgeons as needed. And then we do all of the procedures together, which works well in an academic center where we're not so uh, <laughs> economically driven um, because we just rotate the billing for them. But um, we do all of the procedures, see all the patients together. So it's it, it's really sort of a dream practice where, you know, I... I work on a daily basis in the interventional radiology suite with my IR partners as well. That's awesome. I and mean, great experience for trainees on both sides as well. Yes. So moving ahead to pelvic congestion syndrome, Michael, uh, I'm going to ask you to, you know, give us some of the basics as first, because, you know, I mean, as, as you pointed out, we could spend hours just talking about the, the diagnosis of pelvic con- congestion syndrome. We'll get into that more, but let's just start with some of the basics. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the basic, pathophysiology of pelvic congestion syndrome? Wow, I don't even know if we could agree on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I mean, the fundamentals, right, are that there's, um, uh, if, if you agree with the term pelvic venous hypertension, which is responsible for the symptoms in the pelvis and, you know, which comes down to pelvic venous insufficiency and ovarian vein reflux. I mean, certainly that was our original thinking of of the disease. Um, I think now as we've learned more and understand the different types of pelvic congestion and how to treat them, that we're really we're really at the scratching the surface of the things that we need to know how to uh, diagnose this disease and then treat this disease and to select patients uh, appropriately. Um, so I mean what are some of the typical manifestations of this? You know, I think in in my practice, we see a lot of just, you know, the typical chronic pelvic pain is our number one um, feature, Uh, you know, in patients, uh, see lots of complaints of dyspareunia. I I find bladder symptoms, although people describe it as certainly not a common thing uh, that we see. Uh, Those would be the main sort of presenting symptoms that are in our clinic. Are you getting many of the, you know, the more atypical presentations, uh, you know, like POTS syndrome, et cetera, you know, for patients to treat? Right. Yeah. Interestingly, we we saw a, a younger female, which sounds exactly like POTS uh, a couple of weeks ago in clinic. Uh, Dr. Wolf saw her. But no, that's not been a, a common experience in, in, in my practice uh, at all. No. Uh, so, Mark, a question for you, you know, What are the majority of these patients, uh, you know, how do they usually end up in your clinic? Uh, You know, who sends them and, and, you know, for what symptoms and and what kind of workup have they usually had before they get to you? You know, probably I would say in in my practice, about um, 30 or 40 percent of uh, women are um, self-referred just um, from networking and from colleagues and, and the like. And then probably the other um, 50 to 60 percent of them come from other um, uh, practitioners, either um, vascular surgeons or interventional radiologists, but but people who are knowledgeable about pelvic venous disease. I get a few uh, referrals from the obstetrics uh, and gynecology community, but it's by far the the minority of them. And and my practice sort of um, spans sort of the whole. Uh, spectrum of pelvic venous disease. So I do get a fair number of patients referred for renal vein compression, who that is ultimately not their primary problem. Um, Many times their primary problem is just ovarian vein incompetence, but I get lots of referrals through that route. uh, And then I see a fair number of of women who come in with with you know extra pelvic varices either in the vulvar region or the posterior thighs and the buttocks who um, are sort of referred 
more as uh, varicose vein patients, but their real problem is a pelvic origin of their, their varicostes. Okay. Yeah, Michael, I mean, you and I had talked a little bit about this before, you know, kind of primary versus secondary causes. I mean, what basically, what does that mean? Like, why is it important to distinguish primary from secondary causes of pelvic congestion syndrome? What are the other etiologies that can cause this clinical syndrome? Right. Yeah. I, I think, you know, people use the verbiage um, differently, you know, the concept of pelvic congestion and then pelvic venous insufficiency. And I, I don't even know if we're using the right terms to describe things. Uh, you know, I, I kind of view primary pelvic uh, congestion as being ovarian vein failure, whereas those with, you know, a compressive syndrome, be it Nutcracker or Maytherner, as secondary uh, causes for, for pelvic congestion. And why is it important to distinguish them, you know, from a treatment standpoint? Well, that's a, that's a great point. And it actually raises, you know, some really interesting questions about the best way to treat some of these patients. You know, if you have, you know, for instance, uh, a patient with May Therner and they have, you know, symptoms of pelvic congestion, the question then is, is, you know, is the primary treatment venous stenting, or do you go ahead and do embolization as your primary treatment, or do you do both at the same time? Uh, I think those are, it's a really interesting uh, discussion, particularly, you know, in younger patients, if they come in and they have absolutely no leg symptoms related to their May Therner, do you really want to put uh, an iliac vein stent in, in them? Or would you start with embolizing the, uh, the varicosities and the ovarian veins and not put a stent in? Uh, you know, I think in a, when you're putting a stent in a younger patient, you've got a long, you know, you're maybe looking at 50, 60, 70 years of latency. Whereas, you know, when I embolize an ovarian vein, the odds of me causing harm to the patient are, are virtually, if you do it technically well, virtually zero. So... Uh, it's, uh, I'm loath to put an iliac vein stent in somebody in a young female without, uh, leg symptoms to, to motivate me to do it. Mark, you feel the same way? I, I absolutely feel the same way. And I think we're, we're heading down a very bad pathway, um, uh, just in general over the last couple of years where, um, some of it is driven by data, um, suggesting that quality of life is better treating the iliac vein than ovarian vein embolization, but that's entirely driven, which I, I think is really a shame, by centers who are doing nothing but left ovarian vein embolization. They're not even looking at the right ovarian vein. They're not looking at the pelvis. They're doing very, very incomplete embolization and saying that it doesn't work um, in the long term which is true because, you know, I, I recently saw a paper at the American Vein and Lymphatic Society a few weeks ago where they showed in young woman, women that if you embolized their ovarian veins, they got better for six months, and then they returned to baseline. Well, all they were doing was embolizing their left ovarian vein, and they're just getting a recurrence from not addressing the other things. So I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about um, that's driving a lot of the venous stenting for it. So I, I totally agree with Michael. And I think it's something that we have to really strive to educate people about that um, thinking that in most patients, you can just uh, only look at the left ovarian vein and only treat the left ovarian vein and ignore the rest of the pelvic circulation is just not adequate. Mark, I think that's, I think that's wonderful that you're, that, that we're on the same page on that. And we, yeah. <laughs> Michael, we didn't plan that, that, uh, <laughs> that's great because, um, yeah, I, I it, it, Mark raises two really important issues, incomplete embolizations because people don't understand the pathophysiology and then inappropriate venous stenting. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a problem. So let's let's talk about kind of the diagnostic approach to these patients. A lot of them will have imaging, you know, that that had been done previously before they get to clinic. Are these exams, you know, really useful to you, or, or do you end up getting additional imaging on pretty much all of these patients? Well, a lot of our patients do come from uh, directly from gynecology, and so they've had an ultrasound done. Um, and often, you know, so they have identified pelvic varicosities and pelvic pain, but they haven't done you know, where you're, you're looking to see if you can determine where the reflux is coming from. And so 
with a detailed endovag uh, ultrasound, you should be able to, to see the ovarian veins and whether or not they're incompetent and uh, also the internal iliac veins. So I think you can kind of determine in a fair number of patients where the leak points are into the pelvic varicosities. So that's my first test is, uh, is a transvaginal ultrasound. Interesting. I would imagine you have to do a lot of educating for your sonographers to get that kind of exam. It sounds more like, you know, a lower extremity reflux study. Yeah, it's, I, and I'm not going to claim that we're, you know, phenomenal at doing it. I had the opportunity to go over to Mark Whiteley's uh, lab in, in London um, and his tech, Judy, Ho I think it's Holdenstock. Uh, they've written a couple of papers about it and they really pioneered doing that. And that really sparked my interest to take the time to learn how to do this. That's interesting. I haven't seen that. Mark, do you end up getting imaging in, in a lot of the patients, you know, either before or after you see them in clinic? You know, I, I, we, we rely um, very, very heavily on ultrasound um, in that our, our, uh, I, I think if people are getting into this, whether it's transvaginal or transabdominal, you know, that is where you should invest your initial time is really getting your ultrasound up, up to speed. Uh, and, and I rely almost entirely on um, transabdominal ultrasound um, for in, initially. And I think the values of transvaginal or transabdominal are you get a, a good look at obstructive etiologies, um, recognizing that you're going to pick up things that are within the range of normal. I mean, you're going to see left renal vein compression that is not the problem. You're going to see common iliac vein compression that is not the problem. Um, but I, I, I like transabdominal ultrasound because it gives you a full assessment where it really breaks down and where I think there is a lot of value, as Michael was saying, is it, with transvaginal ultrasound is transvaginal ultrasound, I think, does give you a much better view of the um, distal internal iliac tributaries, which... Um, is not that great on transabdominal ultrasound. You can get some of that information um, by looking through the pelvic floor and the perineum. But I think if there's one weakness of transabdominal ultrasound is it's looking at the distal tributaries of the uh, internal iliac vein in particular, which transabdominal ultrasound um, tends to miss. I, I don't rely in most cases on cross-sectional imaging at all. We will occasionally get it if there's some, some inconsistencies that are raised on ultrasound, but generally we go um, right from transabdominal ultrasound um, to venography with uh, simultaneous treatment most of the time. Sure. Uh, Michael, last year when we were, were talking about IVIS, uh, you shared a protocol used for a CT venogram that, you know, you said gives you really good quality diagnostic images. Uh, I'm curious uh, when and if you're getting those now, like in what scenarios do you think it's it's necessary? Yeah, the, it's an interesting discussion. So, you know, you're basically, uh, or way of imaging, so you're basically doing, you know, a CTA, but in the venous phase and, you know, doing, you know, submillimeter reconstructions and then, you know, in the arterial world, the, the computers can automate your center line, whereas, you know, the venous, the contrast bolus is rarely good enough that the, you know, center line tools work. Uh, but you can reconstruct a center line through the veins. It's a little time consuming. And then you can measure uh, true area measurements, just like you would do on IVIS, and, uh, and really come up with how compressed uh, an iliac vein is or, uh, or if there's a nutcracker. You know, you, you see a lot of examples in the literature of a compressed iliac vein and people, you know, on a, on a standard axial uh, uh, image. And that's it's just, you know, it has nothing. It's just not not an accurate representation of what's going on. I think the other interesting uh, advantage of the of doing the CT is, you know, the anatomy when you're going in. And, and yeah, a lot of the anatomy is predictable, but, you know, I'm not sure it saves a lot of time, but, you know, if you're looking for that right ovarian vein, if you have the CT, you know where it is and you're not struggling for 15 minutes and, you know, burning through a lot of fluoro and contrast doing it. It would be an interesting comparison to see uh, procedure times if you could reduce them um, significantly if you had a CT on everybody and you knew exactly where their, uh, where the anatomy was. But uh, I do, I really like having these CT venograms. So I, I, I'm going to be an outlier in that world, but I, I really like it. And, and I, I actually 
I actually do agree with Michael as, as well on that, that, that the one place where the CT can be really helpful is knowing where to look for the right ovarian vein. Uh, now, this might be a loaded question, but, you know, for a patient who comes in and, you know, she's got either, you know, imaging findings of pelvic congestion syndrome and certainly symptoms, but, you know, she also has leg swelling and varicosities and, and maybe even, uh, you know, some evidence of, of renal vein compression. How do you take to, you know, put together all this information and figure out the right place to start in their treatment? You know, I mean, it could be anything in that circuit of, you know, renal vein, iliac vein, or, um, or ovarian vein. I will tell you that, the, you know, the overwhelming place to start is just with the patient's demographics and, and history. Sure. Um, mostly because if you, you look at it, and, and I th I, even the older series in the literature, I think, are accurate in that I think most women, which is most of the patients I see anyway, who present um, with chronic pelvic pain of, of venous origin is from ovarian internal iliac incompetence. And, and, and you know, those patients are... The um, 20 to 30 year old young patients, usually multiparous, and that should point you in that direction. On the other hand, you, you know, symptoms related to primary um, ovarian vein incompetence are pretty rare in nulliparous women, women. So if a woman comes and has never been pregnant off the start, it ought to guide you in a different direction. And the same goes for um, uh, postmenopausal women. Many of the, the symptoms related to primary uh, ovarian internal iliac vein incompetence do get better with menopause. Not, not always. Um, you do see some women with that, but it ought to point you in a different direction if they're postmenopausal. And then look at um, concurrent leg symptoms. You know, are they complaining of, of heaviness and achiness in their legs? And I think if you look, as Michael was talking about previously, some of the iliac veins stenting for pelvic symptoms, 60 or 70 percent of those women are walking into the office with leg complaints. And then when they're questioned, they say, oh, yeah, I have some some pelvic pain and things like that. And in all of those series, it's a much older population. You look at most of the um, women presenting with primary ovarian vein incompetence, the average age is usually in the early 30s in most of the series. You look at the, the series, the large series of iliac vein stenting, those women tend to be in their late 40s, early 50s on average, with some, you know, some of those series have women into their seventh and eighth decades. And those aren't the patients that I'm seeing who are 20 and 30 years old walking in with primary pelvic pain and no leg symptoms. So I think, you know, a good history can point you in the right direction to start with. And that that probably is the most worthwhile thing in guiding you what to look at. And then I look, you know, uh, as I mentioned a lot at the ultrasound, understanding that you're going to see, um, and, I, and the same thing goes for cross-sectional imaging, you're going to see things that are really uh uh, a range of normal with um, some patients with left uh, renal vein compression, some pe patients with uh, common iliac vein compression. And just because you see those on an imaging study, whether it be cross-sectional imaging or, or ultrasound, doesn't necessarily mean um, that that's the culprit. So I think you have to marry the imaging findings with the clinical history as well. And if you, if you look at some of the older data, which I think is very good, particularly beard studies from 20 years ago, you know, the physical exam parts of it, which I think most of us as interventionalists are not um, that good at. But in the old beard data, you know, the combination of the history of postcoital ache, you know, lasting for one to two hours uh, after intercourse, as well as the findings of tenderness over the ovarian point, which is a, a point a third of the way along between the umbilicus and the anterior superior iliac spine, has about an 86 percent positive predictive value for it being um, an, ov an ovarian vein reflux cause. So I, I do think even if you're, I, I wish I could say we all did uh, a, a great uh, pelvic exam as part of our um, workup. Most of us don't, but I do think, you know, you at least ought to palpate the abdomen and seeing if they have tenderness over the ovarian point and correlating that with the history. And I, and I think issues such as uh, post postcoital pain are, are really valuable in discerning, you know, potential venous etiologies of, of pelvic congestion. Right on. That's really useful. Um, it sounds like you both have uh, a really reliable system or algorithm in, in making a pretty confident diagnosis. Uh, and one thing that I think is important for these patients is really setting expectations. Uh, and Michael, I'm curious just how you go about doing this. I mean, these patients often have you know pretty vague symptoms. 
you know, the, the pathophysiology can be complex. And, you know, these are patients that have a history of being challenging to treat. It's how a lot of them end up in our clinic. Um, how do you frame goals and expectations uh, of treatment for these patients? Yeah, that that's really tough, uh, Mike. You know, the um, when you look at, say, a claudicate or someone that comes in with exertional leg pain, you pop them on the treadmill, their ABI goes from 0.8 to 0.3. You know when they fix when you fix uh, their uh, SFA occlusion, they're going to be happy with you. Probably ninety nine out of one hundred times. Where is uh, the pelvic congestion? You know, we just don't. You don't have that slam dunk imaging where you say, "I I see X, and if we do Y, you're going to feel better." Um, so it is really tough, and expectation setting is really important uh, in in these patients, and and also the potential for a second. Uh, procedure uh, after the first one. So um, I I tend to, you know, downplay or, you know, I tend to say, you know, there's, a, you know, 50, 75 percent chance we're going to make X better. But I think it's it's really hard, at least in my experience, to, to predict with confidence uh, that you're going to make somebody uh, feel better. I would agree with that, and I think uh, I think that's totally correct. And one of the things we've we've tried to start doing from a academic standpoint is to get particularly some of the um, chronic pelvic pain um, pathologists more engaged with working with the venous community about this. I think one of the things they brought um, really to our attention is is just how you know chronic pelvic pain in women is is very complex with frequently. Um, have multiple overlapping pain generators where, you know, they, they have veins that may be responsible for a significant portion of their presentation, but it may not be the only one. Um, so I think that's an important thing to remember. The other thing is, I, I think, um, looking at it, there are some things that are, are, are predictive that you're not going to get as good of response. I think everyone who takes care of these patients knows that there's a, a high degree of underlying psychosocial issues, high incidence of anxiety, depression, um, catastrophization, and particularly catastrophization, you know, if that's sort of in the patient's um, present presentation, I think you have to be pretty cautious. It doesn't mean they ought to be treated, ought not to be treated. They definitely should be treated because it is one of the pain generators involved, but I think you have to counsel them fairly extensively ahead of time that um, sometimes these features are a, are a marker for incomplete Im improvement. And I think some of the other things, um, uh, uh, urinary symptoms uh, in, a, in a lot of the literature tend to be associated with not as good of an outcome and, and extra pelvic varices as well. And I think part of that is, is that I think it's unreasonable to think if you have a woman presenting with chronic pelvic pain plus extra pelvic varices, that just treating their pelvic varices is going to take care of the extra pelvic varices. And I think you have to, particularly in that patient population, counsel women that, you know, this is going to require two procedures to take care of uh, both of this. If you have both pelvic pain plus symptomatic extra pelvic varices, it will help a bit to take care of the the pelvic varices, but clearly you're going to require a second procedure to take care of the extra pelvic ones and vice versa. If they present primarily with extra pelvic varices, so we can take care of those, may not make your pelvic pain entirely better. Mark, I, I would be interested to hear if you kind of feel like if I see this, that this is going to get, you know, my odds of making this better, like say dyspareunia or postcoital pain or pelvic heaviness at the end of the day, do you, do you ever give numbers with odds of improvement? You know, I, uh, I, I tend to use the same numbers you do. I say the odds are, you know, about um, 70%. If, if I think if my clinical uh, intuition that, that the pelvic uh, venous disease is contributing the presentation, I, I say there's about a 70% chance that we can make you better. That doesn't necessarily that going to mean they're entirely resolved. And I usually use the example, if you're coming in with, you know, a, a seven out of 10 uh, daily pain, we may be able to get that, you know, in a perfect world, we'll get that down to nothing. But um, uh, you, we may get you down to a two or three, but we may not really take care of it. So I, I like the figures you said about 70% or so we can make an improvement in. And I, and I do, uh, you know, based on those factors, like the anxiety, depression, catastrophization, I, I sort of warn them it may not be as complete in that situation. And, you know, if there's a lot of uh, 
other lying symptoms that go along with it, um, painful bladder syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, things like that, we're probably not going to make those better with this. Right. Okay. I mean, some of these young women, I mean, they've been traumatized by this, you know, <laughs> they're, yes. uh, you know, they're in their late twenties. Uh, they no longer uh, want to have intercourse and it, no one tells, everyone tells them it's in their head and it's terrible uh, for them. For sure. And, you know, they're there. And I think, you know, in some of those patients, really a, a multimodality approach is really helpful. Uh, they, they should definitely have their veins taken care of. But, you know, there's the, the pain literature talks about central sensitization and things, which I think can be a problem in, in women who have had really this longstanding pelvic pain that is extremely traumatic to them. You know, they may need some help with uh, particularly, I, I work with a chronic pain specialist who um, is very helpful after you've taken care of their um, pelvic veins to help them with that central sensitization part of things. 